So we are in the midst of the ten plagues of God that he is bringing against Pharaoh, that he's bringing against the uh, nation of Egypt. And there are also judgments against the false pagan gods that the Egyptians worshipped. In essence, God is using the miracles of these plagues to preach the truth of who he is. Uh, I entitled this, Can You Hear Me Now? Remember that? Cell phone commercial, can you hear me now? Well, God is speaking loud and clear through these judgments, and yet Pharaoh is not listening. He is not heeding the voice of the Lord. Again, we're talking about God, Yahweh, the everlasting God, the great I Am as He revealed Himself to Moses, El Shaddai, the Almighty One, the Creator of the heavens and the earth, everything in it. Unfortunately, seeing miracles doesn't always equate to believing in the one true God. Oftentimes people will see something miraculous. Uh, they'll simply, you know, write it off as a strange natural phenomena. But God does miraculous things all the time, but recognizing that it is from God, it depends upon the condition of your heart. It depends upon uh, the condition of your mind. It reminds me of two guys who were good friends growing up one of the guys was a perpetual optimist. The other guy was a perpetual pessimist. If the optimist said, oh, it's going to be a beautiful day today, nice and sunny, the pessimist would say, yeah, and we'll probably all get skin cancer and die. And, you know, if it was a rainy day, the optimist would say, oh, this is great. We need the rain. And the pessimist would say, well, it's probably just going to bring out more weeds in my yard. You might, well, you're not laughing because a lot of you are like that, right? <laughs> so the two of them go duck hunting together, and the optimist just got a new dog. He's been training it, and he brings a dog with them on their boat, and uh, he just says, oh, you got to check out this dog. He is amazing. And so he shoots the duck, and he tells the dog, go fetch the duck. And so the dog jumps out of the boat into the water and walks on water and walks all the way over to the duck, gets a duck, walks on water, back, jumps in the boat, and the optimist says, wow, wasn't that amazing? Could you, have you ever seen anything like this? Well, the pessimist looks at the dog, and then he looks at his friend and says, well, your dog can't swim, huh? <laughs> Again, seeing isn't always believing. In fact, the more miracles God does, in the land of Egypt, the harder Pharaoh's heart becomes. Uh, God has always and continues to do supernatural things. Uh, we see this throughout the Bible. I mean, if you believe the very first verse of the Bible, Genesis 1-1, the rest of the Bible should make a lot of sense. In the beginning, God created, the word created bara in the Hebrew means to create something out of nothing. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So all the universe, everything you see, all the unseen, God created it by just speaking it into existence. He created the first two human beings. He did everything in those first six days that we call the days of creation. In Genesis chapter 7, after the population has grown tremendously, we see God bringing a flood upon the entire earth. Only Noah and his family and then all the animals on the ark were spared, but we're told God did that because of the wickedness of the heart of human beings. They were doing horrible things to one another. They were exceedingly wicked and evil towards God. Uh, again, we see many miracles taking place, even from the flood to what we're looking at here in Exodus. God does miraculous things. But it was concentrated here as we're looking at these plagues in Egypt. Well, 600 years after Exodus, we'll see another set of miracles at the hands of the prophet Elijah and then Elisha. They'll do some amazing things as well. And then there's, you know, God does miraculous things, but not on a concentrated level until 900 years after Elijah, Jesus shows up. The Son of God, God the Son, and he is just blowing people's minds. He's doing about every miracle you can think of. And what did the, the, the religious leaders say? Crucify him. Just like Pharaoh. They, they had hard hearts. But Jesus was healing the sick. He's cleansing lepers. He's opening blind eyes and deaf ears. He's feeding thousands of people with a little boy's lunch. Um, 
raising people from the dead. And still, most people did not believe in Jesus. Even today, Jesus is still doing many signs and wonders. Looking around here, the greatest miracle he's done is saving you and saving me. Sinners who don't deserve to be saved. And yet, what a miracle that he would cause us to become born again, to bring us out of darkness into his glorious light, to bring us into heaven when our lives on earth are finished. What a miracle that is, that he could save somebody like me. But then... We're going to see another set of miracles in the near future. Well, we will see them from the mezzanine when we're in heaven. After the rapture of the church, God is going to send a seven-year great tribulation where he's pouring out his wrath and judgment upon a Christ-rejecting world. But then we come back with the Lord at his second coming. And he's going to take this world that's on the brink of annihilation. He's going to restore it. It's going to be like the Garden of Eden for a thousand years. But then, there's more. But wait. But then, after a thousand years, he's going to vaporize the entire universe. All the planets, solar systems, billions of whatever galaxies we have out there. He's going to vaporize it all. Check out 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 10. He burns it all up, it says, with fervent heat. But what does he do? He creates, out of nothing, a whole new heaven and a new earth. a new Not heaven where we're dwelling, but a new universe and a new earth where righteousness will dwell forever and ever. So our God is truly a miracle-working God. And as we come into Exodus chapter 9, God continues to speak loud and clear to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians as he sends these plagues upon Egypt. Uh, we saw the first plague where God turned the water in Egypt, specifically the Nile River, into blood. And then we saw the frogs that come on the land, and then all the lice, and then all the flies. And even after witnessing and experiencing all these plagues personally, we saw that Pharaoh's heart grew harder and harder. All Pharaoh had to do is heed God's word, listen to Moses, let the people of Israel go, Go out in the wilderness, worship God. That's all he had to do, and God would have stopped the plagues immediately. So the lesson, one of the key lessons we see in the book of Exodus is that pride and a hard heart always has consequences. Every time. It'll always bring misery to yourself and to those around you. And one of the big lies of Satan is, oh, my sins don't hurt anybody else. My sins only affect me. But after 30 plus years in the ministry, let me just say that's not true. Your sins, your rebellion will always hurt others in one way or another. Don't be like Pharaoh. Humble yourself before God. Turn from your sin. Turn to the one who loves you. Turn to the one who wants to save you because only he can heal and restore and fix the hurt lives that you've caused the hurt in your own life, only he can restore the relationships that we've made a mess out of. So look at chapter 9. We'll go through the entire chapter, hopefully. Well, we get all day. Chapter 9, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and tell him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. <clears throat> For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the oxen, and on the sheep, a very severe pestilence. And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel." Then the, Lord, then the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. So the Lord did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died. But of the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. Then Pharaoh sent, and indeed, not even one of the livestock of the Israelites was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh became hard and he did not let the people go. And so, again, every animal that's in the field, 
dies. Take note of that. They were in the field. We're going to see later on there's more livestock. Where were they? Well, they brought many of their livestock under shelters, in barns and so forth. They were spared, but only the ones in the field died. This, though, is another successful demonstration of God's power and authority over Egypt, over Pharaoh, and especially over the pagan gods that they worshipped. Many of the pagan gods they worshipped were identified with these domesticated animals. One of the chief gods of Egypt was this guy that was named, well, not a guy, this bull <laughs> that was named Apis, A-P-I-S. The female god that they worshipped, the cow god, was Hathor, H-A-T-H-O-R. And these were very prominent in Egypt's worship. In fact, in the Egyptian city of Memphis, uh, archaeologists found a stable where they raised these bulls that they would worship. But then they dug under the stable and they found, think of this, 2,000 pound bull, they found them mummified. It's hard enough to mummify a body, but they mummified these cows that they worshiped perpetually, you know, thinking they'll, they'll come back in the next life or whatever they believed. So th this was their God of strength, the bull. This was their God of power. By the way, when we get to Exodus 32, we'll see that God gets very angry with the Jewish people, the Israelites. Why? Because Moses is getting the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. He comes down, and what is Aaron made? A golden cow, a bull. And the people were worshiping this golden bull. Pretty amazing that they would do this. Where, well, in fact, they, they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. This golden bull? Are you kidding me? It's just so sad. So where do the Israelites get that picture of God in their hearts being a you know, big, massive bull? Well, they lived in Egypt for 430 years. It was droned into them. We worship this golden bull, this golden cow, whatever it is. Notice that God, once again, makes a distinction, though, between the livestock of Egypt and the livestock of the Israelites who were in Egypt in the land of Goshen. Pharaoh even sends some of his men over to Goshen to see, wow, what's going on? They didn't lose one animal of all their livestock? And it was true. But we see this throughout the Bible. God makes a distinction between his people and those who are not saved. He makes a distinction between those who are justified and those who are not justified, between the righteous and the wicked. And the classic example is when God is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, those perverse cities there, and Abraham, his nephew Lot, was dwelling in Sodom. And so he gets into this negotiation with God, uh, when he finds out God's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, well, Lord, what if there's 50 righteous in the city of Sodom? Are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? And so this is what God says in Genesis 18, verse 26. God responds, so the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Then, you know, you know the, the negotiation and goes, what if there's 45 God says, I'll spare it for the 40. What about 30? What about 20? What about 10? And God says, even if there's 10 righteous, I'll spare the, the city. Well, as you know, when the angels showed up, there weren't, weren't even five. There was only four. Lot, his two daughters, and his wife, who had a habit of eating too much salt. Um, so when they show up, one of the angels tells Lot, you need to flee to this town called Zoar. I cannot do anything until you get out of here before judgment comes. It's in Genesis 19, verse 22. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything. This is the angel speaking to Lot. Until you arrive there, therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. And so God's judgment did not fall um, until after Lot was removed. I think that's God's pattern. Judgment doesn't come until after he's got his people safe and secure. Noah on the ark, then judgment comes. At the rapture, we're taken out, then his seven years of wrath will be poured out on this planet. Second Peter 2.9, speaking about the judgments of Sodom and Gomorrah, 
It says, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of the temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. And so again, we'll see this, especially during the Great Tribulation, when God pours out his wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world. He removes his bride first. Um, we are those who turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And then as Paul says to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10, to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who, what? Delivers us from the wrath to come. So he's going to deliver us. He always does. Uh, if you need more verses, Romans 5, 9, and then also uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. God didn't appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. That doesn't mean we're immune to trials and struggles and disappointments and hardship. We all face these things in this life. We're not immune to that. Jesus tells his disciples when he's about to be crucified, you're going to be... Uh, you know, scattered, you're going to have to flee for your lives. Then he says this in John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And so the tribulation he's speaking of there is not God's wrath, but he's speaking of the tribulation that comes upon us from the world, from our own flesh, things we do wrong and sinful actions, and from Satan. We are not immune to the attacks of the enemy. So even though we're not immune to the trials that come upon us from this world, uh, before God pours out his wrath, he will catch us up to be with him in glory. I hope you understand that. It's so important. In the meantime, if God does allow us to go through difficult times in our lives, because Christians are not immune to persecution and difficulties, we need to re remind ourselves that God is on the throne. He allows things to happen for a reason, but he wants us to draw near to him. He wants us to stay close to him. And then if you go through something, there's always something to learn from the trial, the struggle you faced, because God wants to now use you to minister to others who've gone through the same struggles and trials and temptations. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Again, God always has a plan and a purpose when he allows us to go through difficult times. But one of the best things about living in this stinky, corrupt world is that it causes us to long for Jesus, to go home to be with the Lord in glory. And especially when you get close to the end of your life and maybe you're going through sickness or disease or whatever it might be, and you know the end is near, how as a believer you longed to be with Jesus. You know, when I, I look back when my mom was on her deathbed and my sisters and I were there at the foot of her bed and uh, she was going to go at any time and her mind was still sharp and we're sitting at the foot of her bed and she got saved when she was 70 and now she's 87 and I was able to lead her to the Lord and it was awesome. We're sitting at the foot of her bed and she wakes up and she looks at her around and she gets this disgusted look on her face I'm like, it's like, mom, what's the matter? You know, it's your kids. He goes, oh, I know. I was just hoping I was going to wake up in heaven. <laughs> That's the attitude we should have. It was awesome. So we go through things. We know God is on the throne. He is in control. But look at verse 7 once again. It says, Then Pharaoh sent, and indeed not even one of the livestock of the Israelites was dead, but the heart of Pharaoh became hard, and he did not let the people go. So even though he knows the truth, he refuses to humble himself before the Lord. And I've always looked at Pharaoh as the poster child for what pride looks like. Uh, Proverbs 28, 14 says, Happy is the man who is always reverent. In other words, you're reverent before God. You acknowledge how awesome God is. But he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. And that's exactly where Pharaoh was headed. Calamity. He was going down quick. Look at verse 8. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, 
Take for yourselves handfuls of ashes from a furnace. We're going to see this is a specific furnace. And let Moses scatter it toward the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh. And it will become fine dust in all the land of Egypt. And it will cause boils that break out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. Then they took ashes from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh. And Moses scattered them toward heaven. And they caused boils that break out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians, the sorcerers of Egypt, could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians and on all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Now, there's some interesting things as we come into plague number six, these nasty boils that break out on man and beast. Notice again, it says the furnace. This was probably the furnace where the Egyptians worshipped the god Typhoon, who is the god over boils. People worship anything, but he was the god over boils. And how did they worship him? They would sacrifice men, women, boys, and girls to Typhoon. So this furnace is probably where the ashes of human beings were. So Moses takes a handful of ashes, throws it in the air, turns to this fine dust, it goes all over Egypt, and everybody in Egypt, except for the Jewish people, break out in boils. Horrible. These you know, pagan rituals that the Egyptians practice. They're no different than us today. I mean, look at all the, what, close to 65 million abortions we've had, sacrificing to the pagan gods of pleasure, riches, Molech, and so forth. The result here was boils in all the people. It's interesting because in uh, Leviticus 13, the same word used for boils here in Leviticus 13 refers to leprosy. The leprosy would always start off looking like a boil, and then it would continue to spread over the whole body. But this is a judgment against the Egyptian gods, not only Typhoon, but it was also against the various so-called healing gods. They had one called Isis, not the terrorist group, but they had a god called Isis. They had another one that was called Sekhmet. He was a god over disease. Another one called Sunu, S-U-N-U, he was a god over plagues and pestilence. What we're seeing here, though, is the one true God, Yahweh, renders them all powerless. Even the magicians, these sorcerers, they were helpless. They are getting all these boils on themselves. They couldn't do anything for the suffering of their own people. But the sad thing is, Pharaoh would not humble himself before the Lord, you would not yield to the mighty hand of God. Again, pride comes before a fall. I mean, this is what Proverbs 29, verses 1 and 2 says. He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck, sounds like Pharaoh, will suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. There's a lot of groaning going on in Egypt. And I know there's a lot of groaning going on in our nation today. You know, when the wicked are in control, there's so much wickedness in our nation. It's so sad. Now, by the way, did you notice the change of wording in verse 12? The first five plagues, it says, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Here it says, and God hardens Pharaoh's heart. This is where it changes from the last five plagues. We'll see that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. It's at this point, God is basically saying, okay, Pharaoh, you want to keep rebelling. You do not want to change. Okay, my hand of conviction is off of you. You're going to go the direction you want to go. And so God has been very patient. He's very persistent. He's been waiting patiently for Pharaoh. He's given him numerous chances to stop the plagues from demolishing his nation. But Pharaoh continues to reject and mock and deny the Lord. But because God is sovereign, he knows the future. And so he's basically saying, okay, have it your way. You're the burger king. Have it your way, Pharaoh. 
and this is the direction it's going to go. God hardens his heart. We see this throughout the Bible. Again, God who is sovereign, who is in complete control. Remember this, God has created us with a free will. This is where there's so much debate. Sovereignty of God, free will of man. It's not one or the other, it's both. We see it throughout the Bible. God is sovereign. He does what he wants, how he wants. But he's also created man with a free will. He will not force anyone to go to heaven. He will not force you to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The only time people will be forced to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord is at the great white throne judgment, where Philippians tells us every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whether they want to or not, they will bow before him. They will recognize he is the one and tr only true Lord and Savior. But it's too late at that point for those who bow before him. But we see this with Adam and Eve, the very first two people God created. He created them with a free will. How do we know that? Well, this is what we're told in Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So it's like God saying, here's your choice, Adam. I've given thousands of trees for you to freely eat from. Delicious fruit, healthy fruit. These will keep you strong. I mean, this will give you life or whatever God says here. Or there's one tree, the knowledge of tree of good and evil. One tree, you pick that one, you're going to die. The day you eat of it, you will surely die. I mean, God was making it so obvious that he wanted the very best for Adam and Eve. But here's the truth. Love requires choice. God does not force anyone to love him, but he has done everything possible to demonstrate his own love toward us. You have a choice to make. Are you going to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? Or are you going to say, no, nah, I'm going to save myself or I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to be like Pharaoh. His greatest demonstration and is the proof that God loves us is that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to die on the cross in our place. That's where you see his love. How do I know God loves me? He sent Jesus to take upon himself the wrath I deserve, the judgment I deserve, because I'm the guilty sinner. And yet God poured it out on his only begotten son. Our sins, which separate us from God, was paid in full when Jesus shed his blood for our sins. This truth is brought to life in verses like this in Romans 5, starting in verse 6. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Who's that? Everybody needs to raise their hand. We're all ungodly without Jesus. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath, God's wrath, through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So we rejoice that we've been reconciled to God. We were at enmity. We were enemies of the cross. And we've been brought into the family of God. He's adopted us into his family. We belong to Jesus. Hallelujah. But Satan has done a great job convincing people that God does not love them. Satan will say things like, well, if God is so loving, why is there all these problems on earth? If God is so loving, why would people go to hell? Think about it. That's such a wrong and false portrayal of God, though. In fact, God doesn't desire or want anyone to go to hell. Jesus says that hell was created for Satan and the demons, those fallen angels. God pleads with people. We see this in uh, Ezekiel. He says, turn, turn from your wicked ways. Why should you die, O house of Israel? 
2 Peter 3, 9, God doesn't desire for any to perish or be destroyed, but for all to come to repentance. That's heart, the heart's desire of God. John 3, 16 and 17, Jesus clearly says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, that's you, that's me, whoever will believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into this world to condemn the world. That's not why Jesus came. That the world through him might be saved. He has done everything to save us. But if we continue to rebel against God, if you choose to reject the free gift of salvation that he's offering you, then who's really responsible for you ending up on the wrong side of eternity in the lake of fire? You know, it's like if you have a deadly disease, you go to the doctor and they say, hey, you're going to die in a week, but I've got medication that will cure you. And if you say, nah, I don't want it, and then you die, well, who's that on? Is it the doctor's fault? No. And to a greater degree, you know, we have a deadly disease called sin. And we go to God and we say, can you help me? And God would say, absolutely. Here's the one cure for your sin, the blood of Jesus. He died for you. He shed his blood for your sins. Come to Christ, receive him, and you will be forgiven. You'll be cleansed. You'll be healed. You'll go to heaven. And if you say like Pharaoh, eh, I don't want it. And if you end up in the lake of fire, who's that on? That's not on God. He gave you every opportunity to get saved. God does love us, and he's demonstrated his love through Jesus. So look at verse 13. Yeah, we'll get through it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For at this time I will send all my plagues to your heart and on your servants and on your people that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Now, if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. I mean, here we see God's getting very personal with Pharaoh here. I'm going to strike you at your very heart. And in no uncertain terms, God is letting him know that his stubbornness, his, his rejection of God's word is going to cost him big time. I mean, the land of Egypt, it's being devastated. It's going to be more devastated. The people of Egypt, they've suffered great loss. They're going to suffer even greater loss with the death of the firstborn. And it's all because Pharaoh would not humble himself and submit to the Lord and let the Jewish people leave Egypt. And in verse 15, notice God even tells him that if God wanted to, he could instantly wipe out all of Egypt and all the Egyptians. He could do that to you. But how patient he's been with us. If you're not a believer today, God is being very patient with you. That's the only reason you're still alive. When I look back at my life, if I didn't get saved when I did, if I would have continued on the path I was on, I would have been dead a long time ago. You know, I was so much in rebellion against God, and he had to intervene. Otherwise, I was going to be toast. This should be a warning to all of us who keep messing around with the flesh, who keep putting off, repenting of whatever sin God is convicting us of. God always wins. And the quicker we learn that, the better. The quicker we turn our lives over to Jesus, the better off we will be. Look at verse 16 now. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. As yet you exalt yourself against my people, and that you will not let them go. So again, this is the sovereignty of God in action. He raised up Pharaoh for this purpose, to show his power, he says, to declare his name in all the earth. The Apostle Paul speaks of this in Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 21. It says, does not the potter have power over the clay? Absolutely, that potter can fashion the clay however he wants. From the same lump, one lump of clay, to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. Now, it's the same Apostle Paul who wrote that that says to Timothy in, the, in a house are vessels for honor and vessels for dishonor. In other words, there's vessels that would, you would use for 
you know, you're, you're eating, you know, you'd serve something on that vessel of honor. You'd have another vessel for dishonor, just say the trash can. But then Paul says, you can have a change in what you are. He says, if you'll repent, God can turn you from a vessel of dishonor, which I was for the first 21 years of my life, putting all kinds of garbage in my life, but then you can become a vessel for honor if you will repent, if you'll turn to the Lord and let God do what he wants to do. God is awesome beyond our comprehension. He raises up, he puts down, he's a God of love and grace and mercy, but he's also a God of power and justice and wrath. But again, God doesn't desire for people to perish. That's why you got to take the whole counsel of God's word. You can't just parry, you know, cherry pick a few verses here and say, see, God said, they're going to heaven, they're going to hell. They're going to heaven, they're going from eternity past. That's not what God did. God knows who's going to receive him, who's going to reject him. That's why you have to take the whole counsel of God's word. Romans 8, 29 says, for whom he foreknew. In other words, God knows everything about everything because he's omniscient. Whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate to become conformed to the image of his son. So he knows from eternity past who's going to receive him, who's going to reject him. You know, if you say, I don't want to believe in God, that's not surprising God. That breaks his heart because Jesus died for you. But if you'll humble yourself, then you'll realize, wow, he did give me free will. The sovereign God that knows all things about all things. Again, God doesn't desire for you to perish, but he wants you to humble yourself, admit you're a sinner, receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now look at verse 18. God even says, Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause very heavy hail to rain down, such as has not been in Egypt since its founding until now. Therefore, send now and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field, for the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home, and they shall die. So again, some were in barns earlier. That's why they weren't destroyed by the pestilence. But now, if you don't bring them in out of the field, they're going to die from hail. Verse 21, or verse 20 he who feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. But notice, he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven and there may be hail, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, on every herb of the field, throughout all the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire darted to the ground. And the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, so very heavy that there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree in the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. So again, he sends this massive hailstorm everywhere except for where the Jews were living. These hailstones were big. These hailstones were heavy. God says, uh, or it says God sent thunder and fire that went to the ground. Probably just lightning strikes, just ripping into the ground. It broke every tree, it says, in the field. Everybody that was still outdoors was probably struck and killed by these massive hailstones. The, the biggest hailstorm on record in the United States was back in 2010. I googled it, so that's why it's true. <laughs> so 2010 in South Dakota, eight inch diameter hailstones fell they each weighed close to two pounds. That's, that's a big chunk of ice. You know, you imagine being in there, that's going to shred trees. That's going to do a lot of damage. Um, the biggest hail stone, uh, storm on record was in 1986 in Bangladesh. And it was almost two and a quarter pound hailstones. Again, pretty massive. That, that's going to do a lot of damage. That'll hurt a lot of people or kill a lot of people. 
during the Great Tribulation, remember a lot of these ten plagues, you see a type of these here, but you see even worse in the Great Tribulation. There'll be hailstones that will weigh 75 pounds about dropping on the earth and it takes place during the time of the battle of armageddon this is why the sun is heated up and scorching the earth you get these 75 that's like you've had 20 pound blocks of ice i mean you stack four of those together it's like a talent of hail that's dropping and it says that the rivers of blood in israel will flow for 184 miles you take all the valleys in Israel, and that's about how they all add up to, and it'll be four feet deep up to the horse's bridles in some area. So these hailstones just crushing people, melting, mixed with all the blood. That's why it's going to flow. That sounds fun right before lunch, doesn't it? So this is what it says in Revelation 16, verse 21. During that, this is one of the final judgments that God sends. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Again, about 75 pounds. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. So you ain't seen nothing yet. Verse 27. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. <laughs> this time? The Lord is righteous. And my people and I are wicked. Entreat the Lord, or you know, pray for me, that there may be no more mighty thundering and hail, for it is enough. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. Now, if these are the only verses you read about Pharaoh, you would say, wow, this guy got saved. This guy's repented. This guy's confessed. This guy's turned to the Lord. But you would be wrong. His repentance, his confession is not sincere, and it's not because I know his heart. It's because the Bible tells us that his heart was not changed. Jesus says you will know them by their fruits. In other words, true confession of your sin, true repentance leads to a changed lifestyle. Again, I'm not what I used to be, and I'm not what I'm going to be. I'm still in process, so I'm not perfect, but I know what I was like, and I know a lot of you what you were like, and I know where you are today, praise the Lord, but I know what God's got in store for us in the future when we won't even be tempted by sin anymore, but we're wanting to please the Lord. We want to surrender our lives to Him. The Bible gives us five examples of people admitting, I've sinned against God, and yet their lives did not change. Um, not only with Pharaoh, but we, we'll see this with Balaam. Remember Balaam the prophet. He gets busted and he finds, I have sinned against God. It didn't change him. He continued to rebel against the Lord and God would strike him down. Remember Achan in the book of Joshua. They crossed the Jordan River under uh, Joshua. Uh, they destroyed Jericho, or God does. The very next town was Ai, a little puny town, and the Israelites are defeated. Why? Because Achan took some of the forbidden stuff from Jericho. God said, don't take anything from Jericho. Don't take their gold or silver, any of their clothing. Well, Achan took some, hid it under his tent. And when he was caught, he admitted, I have sinned, and yet he was stoned to death. There's also King Saul. He said, I have sinned against the Lord, but his heart got harder. Shimei, he's the one that was blasting King David. And he said, I have sinned, but he met his downfall. Judas Iscariot. He said the same thing, I have sinned, but he did not have a change of heart. True repentance will always lead to brokenness toward sin, plus obedience to Jesus and to the word of God. Finally, look at verse 29. Well, not finally, sorry. That's what Paul says halfway through his letters, right? In closing, and he's only half done, so be patient. So Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you will not let yet fear the Lord God. Now the flax and the barley were struck. So we know what time of year this was. It's in February. Passover will take place mid-April. 
all 10 of these plagues took almost a year for God to accomplish. He could have done it quicker, but he was patient. But verse 32 says, But the wheat and the spelt were not struck, for they are late crops. Habakkuk, the prophet, when he's seeing what God is about to do to the Israelites because of their sin and how he's going to bring Babylon in and, and bring judgment upon Israel, Habakkuk cries out, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. And God does. Even when he's judging, there's still mercy. Even in this, we see God's mercy. Yeah, he takes out the, the barley and the flax, but he left the wheat and the spelt. Verse 33, now we'll wrap it up. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh, spread out his hands to the Lord. Then the thunder and hail ceased. The rain was not poured on the earth. And remember, Egypt only averages one inch of rain a year. So this was really a strange time for them. So the, uh, ceased and the rain was not poured on the earth. Verse 34, and when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more. And he hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hard. Neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. He sinned yet more. This is a huge warning sign. Don't take God's grace for granted. By his grace and mercy, he did not wipe out Egypt and all the Egyptians. But Pharaoh is a lot like religious people today. They plead with God, help me, God, get me out of this situation. But as soon as relief comes, they just fall right back into the pig pen of sin. Their attitude lacks gratitude. Listen, Jesus loves you. He died for you. He does want the best for your life. But without Jesus as your Lord and Savior, eventually everything will come crushing down around you. But even if, and maybe some of you have experienced this as Christians, you've got caught up in something, your life crashed in around you, guess what? God is not done. God is great at picking up the pieces of our broken lives and picking up those pieces and putting us back together once again. Why? Because if you're his child, he will never bail out on you. Even if we bail out on him, we're safe and secure in his hands. Amen? Amen.